Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So as I said at the beginning, you know, I, I listening to Right Wing Dribble today, and it was all about the division. It was all about, uh, you know, the woman who looked mad during the national anthem. It was all about, you know, the crime surge. Uh, nothing about, you know, Mitch McConnell and the, the Republicans uh, filibustering, talking about uh, the, the For the People Act. Because, uh, look, you know, they're doing a great job in the states of, of rigging the, uh, the 2022 elections. And here to share some thoughts on, well, are we ever going to see anything on the For the People Act? And is it going to come up again? I have Democrats just gone. Okay, next. Uh, here to share some thoughts. I've asked our good friend Harvey K to come talk with us. Uh, Harvey is a professor of democracy. One of my, I think, one of my favorite titles ever. Uh, the the professor of democracy at the University of Wisconsin Green Bay. He's also a fantastic author. Uh, he's written Thomas Paine and the Promise of America: The Fight for Four Freedoms and Take Hold of Our History, as well as the FDR book on democracy. Harvey, thanks for taking time for us. Always take time for you. Always take time. Uh, you've actually written more books than I think I've read. <laughs> I'm kidding, but uh, you've got a long list there, and I, I hope folks will take a look at them. But let's get to this voting thing, because this is pretty important. Pretty important who's going to be able to vote in 2022. Uh, at this point, if, I, if, I'm, if I'm chalking up the lines on the game, uh, the Republicans are kicking the Democrats behind. Yeah, it, d- definitely kicking, kicking. I mean, you know, I don't think... I don't think we're prepared intellectually and mentally and emotionally for exactly what we're up against. In other words, I don't think we quite grasp that there are folks and otherwise known as Republicans who absolutely could care less about. Well, first of all, I don't think they subscribe to the idea of the United States as as a democracy in the making. Okay, I don't want to call it, you know, a made democracy, democracy in the making. You know, I remember years ago, I hope you don't mind my going off a little bit on this. Years ago, must have been back in the 80s, and I was in the library, and I came across a magazine whose title I'm blanking on this minute, but it was the magazine of the John Birch Society. And it, at the time, they were still, I believe, in Belmont, Massachusetts, but they were moving to Appleton, Wisconsin, which is about 35 miles south of here. Uh, which is also where Joe McCarthy happens to be buried. And and I'll never forget how insistent they were in their editorials that the United States was never intended to be a democracy. It was to be a republic, which, by the way, in the late 18th century, the line between a republic and a democracy was both minimal and significant. Minimal to the extent that a republic was decidedly not to be a monarchy or an aristocratic order, it was to be, if you like, um, a, a place where at least manhood suffrage might well prevail. And, and basically the, the founders had in mind a, manhood, a white manhood suffrage. Well, the imperative that's built into the idea of rep- the original republicanism was very radical. And the majority of Americans in the wake of reading Thomas Paine's Common Sense and the preamble to what, you know, those opening paragraphs of the Declaration, they actually believed that they were involved in the making of a democratic republic. Well, here we are, right, 245 years later. My math is off probably, 200, right? Is that it? Yeah, right there, yeah. Good yeah. job. 240, yeah, that's pretty impressive, wasn't it? <laughs> 245 years, I got to remember that number. Gold right star. Right. Right, 245 years later, and I think the John Birch Society idea has come to prevail inside. I mean, it's clearly that the Republican Party is the John Birch Society today in the 21st century. Yeah, but then, isn't that the whole words, argument for originalism? I mean, is isn't that what you know the Scalia's of the world were preaching about original intent and what the Federalist Society you know goes on about as well? Same idea. Yeah. Right. Well, and even the likes of Susan Collins right now, basically, you know, that we're going to leave all these all these because if you read the Constitution closely, you know, it says that the states have, you know, basically control over the sort of electoral process and so on. But clearly in the wake of the 60s, my generation probably believed we had come to the point of transcending the state's rights that had for so long, first of all, you know, 
defended and, and gone to war over slavery. And later, you know, what was established in the late 19th century as the Bourbon regimes. I mean, we probably believe we had finally transcended that. And what we've seen now for the last 50 years is really an, a war on the democratic ideals of the New Deal and especially then on top of that, the Great Society years and the struggles for civil rights and voting rights, you know, Medicare and Medicaid, uh, immigration reform. I mean, it's just amazing. And here we are now. And I thought year after year of these last 45 years that the Democrats would have would have somehow gotten it into their heads that they were not just that they were not just one of two political parties, that they were the party of FDR. And what had made FDR so successful was his willingness, though he, though he used the word occasionally, but the willingness to go radical. And that is radical in defense of democracy and that the only way to defend democracy was to enhance it. It's as simple as that. And what we've been doing is fighting a kind of defensive campaign for all of these years and, and I have to say that I believe the Democrats are in good part culpable for where we are today. If they so, had stood up, I'm sorry, I know I'm going on, but this no, is so in my mind I, all day. Right. If I could stop you on that point, because, yeah. you know, you, you, you mentioned something that caught my attention, that the answer was more democracy, uh, that, you know, we weren't we weren't shutting things down. Is this the argument for getting rid of the filibuster then? Because I've been saying for a while it's been been used to, to stop progress on a number of fronts. The Senate has been the place where democracy goes to die because of this filibuster. Is that not now you go? Because uh, the argument I get from my Democratic friends is, well, we can't get rid of the filibuster because when they take power, they're going to destroy Social Security and Medicare and all of those things, which probably is, is true. But I don't doubt that Mitch McConnell would destroy uh, destroy it anyway. Uh, is that not the argument, though, the idea of more democracy? Yeah, exactly. I mean, well, we, we clip, you know, now to go back to your, to your original thoughts, the For the People Act is absolutely essential, by the way just to get back to the Voting Rights Act and to give it all the more, you know, meat, you might say, to give it all the more heft, because clearly, you know, when they ripped out that that the element of the Voting Rights Act, the preclearance, that, the preclearance, right? It was obvious that you couldn't just literally restore preclearance. You had to go beyond it. You had to literally. And here we are. But and I'm sure you and I fully agree that it's not s simply a matter of the For the People Act. That's a, that's a kind of baseline for, for restoring democratic life in America. It's also, and I, I will insist on this, that it's no less important, but no less likely right now to pass the PRO Act. I mean, if you do not have, look, where we are today, 45 years, almost 50 years after the declarations of war against labor made by the likes of David Rockefeller, you know, the Trilateral Commission, the new right of Reagan, if, if we haven't realized that the greatest, the greatest enemy, okay, that the Republicans have always had in their minds as the agents of big business is the labor movement. The labor movement was and is the means to maintain, if you like, true civil society and to stand up. How, how else are we going to stand up to big, to big business, to big corporations? Right. Not to mention, you would have thought the Democrats would have figured out the only way they're going to ever overcome the utter imbalance in the U.S. Senate, given the likes of states like, you know, Wyoming and that the red states with their two senators each, in spite of their lower population numbers, that the only thing to do is to make sure that your troops and I mean civilian troops are ready to go in elections. And who are the foremost canvassers? What organizations have been so adamant about making sure the Democrats at least try to win elections? It's been the labor movement, whether it was the industrial unions of the past or the teachers unions and the nursing unions of today. I mean, what does it take for Democrats to realize that we are in a crisis of democracy, not unlike that which Lincoln confronted in 1860, that FDR confronted in 19. 32 and then 33 when he took office. I mean, what does it take? So, you know, the question we face now is, okay, if we can't get the For the People Act, we can't get the PRO Act, what the hell do we do? And so I'm putting all my last hopes, you might say, in this infrastructure question, because the infrastructure plan 
that he originally proposed, not this bipartisan thing, which is actually dangerous. I mean, really, really dangerous. Why? Because it has built into the possibilities of privatizing public assets. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that was the, the, whole, how, the question of how do you pay for these things? They won't allow for the higher taxes. Right. So they've actually built into it the possibility of handing over public assets to selling off public assets. And I don't, mean we learned... paintings in art, I don't mean paintings in art museums, which themselves are public assets. You know, I'm talking about, you know, look, Indiana sold off its toll road, right? I mean, how many other states, you know, people look closely. Chicago, I think, sold off their, uh, you know, their parking arrangements. No, no. And in fact, you know, that came up today. I was at a rally in, in Harrisburg talking about public transit. And I had asked one of the people from Pittsburgh, how are you addressing the privatization issue? Because Pittsburgh had privatized their transit authority, or I mean, their their parking authority. And yeah. in their contract, it specifically says you can't increase transit without compensating us for the lost revenue of people not parking in our garages and in our spaces. Yeah. Uh, because yeah. they're smart. They figure this stuff out. They know every angle on how to make sure that their their profits are secure. And the kid was like, I, I'd never heard of that. I go, you should probably be able to answer that question because it's, it's, it's going to pop up. Yeah. So, okay. So here's my, let's, let's imagine for a moment that despite the gaffes or whatever else, that Biden and the Democrats are serious about the infrastructure plan, that they're that this bipartisan, bipartisan thing is just basically to show Manchin how uncooperative the Republicans are. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm grabbing at straws here. Let's hope that it's Biden's effort last gasp to do some kind of bipartisan signing. The fact is that if we don't go big, and he'd already come down off the necessary figures of the two something, 2.3 2.2, I think it was. Yeah, and it had come down to what one point three in the in the short term. If we don't do that, it's and it isn't because you need, we need a victory. We actually need to start addressing the physical infrastructure and the social infrastructure that he introduced into the discussion of infra, into the whole discussion of infrastructure. Moreover, I probably told you this before, and this was a lesson of the New Deal years, a major lesson of the New Deal years, that. If you want to transcend the crisis that we confront right now, which was exacerbated to the nth degree by the Trump administration of dividing Americans by race, ethnicity and faith, if you're going to try to transcend that, you're not going to do it by way of telling people to, re to redeem the soul of America. You're not going to do it by talking about unity. You're going to do it by bringing Americans together in nation building projects and endeavors. OK, that if that they will see that what they can accomplish in solidarity, not simply by watching nice, nice speeches about unity. I, I mean, I, you may hear the anger in my voice. I, I am seriously angry and worried about about the future. You know, I tweeted today or yesterday. I said, you know, I really had hoped that 2021 was going to be a year where I did not have to resort to my hero Thomas Paine's lines. These are the times that try men's souls. And it keeps coming. It's haunting me like every hour I, as if if you could repeat a tweet every hour, I just repeat. That would it. be it. That, that would be on, on a loop. Uh, but here's <laughs> the thing. And I agree with you 100 uh, percent. You need to make people's lives better. We need transformational changes and you need a, a direction. Uh, you know, and and I fear that the Republicans understand that better than the Democrats do, which is why they've drug out this negotiation. And yeah. I still expect them to kill the bipartisan bill at some point in the future anyway. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, they get this. They don't want that kind of of of, of unity, that kind of of, of national direction because uh, they're happy right where things are at. Yeah. Well, here's the here's the bright spot. In, in the midst of all this fog. No, fog. wait. No, you've got a bright spot? <laughs> uh, yes, I do. I do. And I think this is this is noteworthy, in fact. Look, for the first time, I think Pelosi has finally realized that she has to recognize that maybe AOC and, and her allies, you know, the, the, the squad, are serious that if they're, if, if indeed they're going to, throw this bipartisan plan in front of the House and the Senate that she has got to listen to those folks because they're going to vote no if that's what the only thing they're offered. 
So there's this idea now that they're going to hold off on that, even if the bipartisan one gets through the Senate, they're going to hold off right. in the House to the uh, up until you know, so that they could literally pass the reconciliation bill that would be the much much larger. Um, That's uh, the aspirational bill at the sure. same time. And I, and by the way, I mean I, I can't imagine Bernie and the squad this time bending to the will of the likes of Chris Coons. OK, I mean, you know, I'm glad you're laughing because I find him a joke and an embarrassment. OK, and, and what's worse is it's an emba- should be an embarrassment to Biden. Biden should be able to call Coons in and say, get off your ass, get in line. This is ridiculous. Good, good slap upside the back of the head like you they bet. used to do in the old days. Yes, you bet. <laughs> where, where, you know what? Vietnam War aside, where's Lyndon Johnson when you need him? No, I, I say this all the time. You know, even you know, you go back through the last couple of Democratic or the last couple of Republican leaders, you know, Tom Delay, uh, Newt Gingrich, they knew how to whip people in the line. You know, yeah, uh, you know, right. We Whatever need- happened to the term? What happened to the term whip? Remember? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe we should send them one. Uh, but but here's the thing, and this is where I, I think um, I'm hoping that the more we talk about this and the more people wake up to the reality that something has to get done, um, and in big ways. I mean, people need to see that life is going to get better because yeah. 2022 again, we're not. I don't think we're going to get anything on voting. Uh, so you, people have to have a reason to come out, especially in that midterm election. Yeah. And if things right. aren't better, uh, I fear bad things. Yeah, look, if Biden were younger, I'd tell him to get out on and start doing the Trump rallies himself. But he's, but he's physically not up to it. I think that's that's pretty apparent. And and Harris is is utterly uninspirational, utterly yeah. uninspirational. No, I, I'm with you on that. Okay. Uh, but, you know, the thing is, is, you know, that's not Biden's shtick. Uh, I think Biden has done the right thing. I, this We may disagree on this. Yes, I'm sure we do. I think him coming to work, doing the job and and not getting involved in the heated rhetoric right away. I think that was the right thing. Oh, wait, don't get me wrong. I just said to someone, I guess it was yesterday, uh, we had a friend over the house and I said, you know, it's the the thing we have to hope is this, that Trump can still capture television attention. Yes, Trump has literally this most devoted cult following that I've ever seen in my life in, you know, in the past 70 years. Well, I wouldn't have seen anything as an infant, but all these decades. But it is the case that, it is hard to imagine him putting together an electoral victory. I'm not even sure that he'll he'll garner the nomination. But I'm going to tell you now. I, I gave you the bright spot. Let me give you the the worrisome stuff. Okay. So I've just read Josh Hawley's book, The Tyranny of Big Tech, and everyone can laugh that you know that Hawley went way out on a limb in favor of Trump. But I'll tell you, Josh Hawley is a very smart character and a very scary one. one a very scary one and and by the way he is a, he is the one figure who can merge the evils of trump and the imagination of reagan i th- this book that he wrote which i thought i'd be able to lambase because i've done a review for the magazine jacobin i actually got blown away because he actually lays out a narrative of america at various points which I could imagine having written myself. So here's this Republican who's already going against the grain of the Republican Party in key ways, which is exactly what Reagan did in the late 70s. And don't forget, I'm sure you realize that Reagan actually was not was not at all the hero for the Eastern elite in the Republican Party. They did not like him. George Bush was okay but not Ronald Reagan, but Reagan had figured out the way you win is you run against your own party, okay? And he did it. And I think Hawley's prepared to literally pull a Trump-Reagan combination. And no, I, no. I, I, you know? I said from the beginning, Trump, you know, on Inauguration Day, uh, I said Trump's going to be bad. It's going to be horrible. It's going to be corrupt. Uh, the, you know, the, the theft, the, the graft, all of that stuff, uh, uh, yeah. going to be front and center, the lies, all that we know. Uh, but we're going to get by him. The scary person, I said this on Inauguration Day, the scary person is the person who picks up all of his 
all of his charisma and all the things that he was able to do and then normalizes the insanity and the and the hatred and all the things that he he has been uh, and Holly, to me, is that guy who who can do all that. And I think yeah. DeSantis is there as well. I think he's a scary figure as well. Oh, God. DeSantis is, though. He can't win a national election. He, he's such an ugly character. <laughs> and I don't even mean he's such an ugly. He can't win a, a national election. But Holly, coming out of Missouri, OK, as Reagan came out of Illinois and went, you know, went and went into politics much later. Holly is somebody to watch out for. Not not in a good way, but to literally watch out for. Scary, scary stuff. So last question I got for you, you know, prediction wise, are we going to get anything on the voting rights or is this is this something where uh, one of the things I've been saying is Democrats better spend a lot of time and effort, uh, maybe not so much put, trying to push something that's not going to get passed legislatively, but getting people registered and being able to leap the tall bounds of, of the obstacles that Republicans have put in place. Uh, any any predictions, any thoughts? Well, you know what? I, I think the chances of a, a real victory in voting rights is about 20%. You're going that high. I'm All very, right. Yeah. 20%. Yeah. Uh, so we got a lot of work to do. But Harvey, I appreciate the time. As always, great stuff, my friend. great. This is fun, Rick, but fun in in a way that's very worrisome at the same time. Uh, scary times ahead. Thanks so much, our good friend Harvey K. Make sure you check out uh, Harvey's work. He's written the book Thomas Paine and the Promise of America, The Fight for Four Freedoms, Take Hold of Our Democracy, and the FDR on Democracy book. Uh, You can get those on the other place that I hate to mention. Uh, Quick break. Right back. Stick around. You're listening to The Rick Smith Show. We're working people. Come to talk. Saving work in America. One show at a time. The Rick Smith Show.